Hello friends and gamers and welcome to the Fortress as well as Cobra Wargaming's channel. I guess because this video is going to go out on both of our channels. So I'm here with Cobra, I'm Jinx, and we're going to today talk about artillery in board games in general. Now usually our talks are a little bit about Global War 36, a little bit more specifically or at least orientated towards games similar to Global War 36 so that it's applicable to stuff like um, Axis and Allies, Global War 36 obviously, and there's a few other games out there that are similar in spirit and in many ways to Global War 36 and so that's kind of what we're going to talk about. Me and Cobra both are designing our own kind of thing on the side so a lot of these ideas we've already incorporated into our own games I'm sure <laughs> there's going to be some crossover there and uh, a lot of ideas I just want to say too that a lot of ideas are naturally evolving ideas for everybody. So if we come up with something or we say something here and it turns out that you or you or you have been creating your own game that has something similar, well, it's just because good ideas tend to rise to the top and, and uh, we're all using the same playbook of history, so sometimes things will be similar. Okay, so what we're talking about today is artillery in the board gaming, in the board gaming world, I guess. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, it definitely has, I guess, the way it's always implemented that I see it. Yeah, I guess uh, with games similar to Axis and Allies and Global War, the units in general, because you want combat to be pretty sim simple uh, mm -hmm. and not have all these different weird modifiers, like units are pretty kind of what I would call flat in the sense yeah. of you know, you're all you're rolling one die and some hit harder than others. Yeah, uh, and and then you have some little things like little. Uh, I guess, uh, modifications made by, say, with uh, historical board gaming, their artillery usually uses the same concept as others, but they also add, like, the first strike rule. Yeah, which that's right. Is, like, pretty popular in their series where yeah, they yeah. get to shoot first and take out casualties, which I think has been pretty effective. I, I've liked it. I think it. so. Um, yeah, it's a good mechanic, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the first game that we know of that started out with that mechanic, with first strike? I... Don't know. I think. Well, I guess Axis and Allies, to to what I know, of, because you have like the submarines. Yeah, which yeah. We're able to do that, but that's true. But that's I true. think as incorporating it onto land, I think mm -hmm. historical board gaming may have been the first ones to do. I think you're right because artillery. yeah, I I think you're right because I think Axis and Allies just gave the boost to the infantry, and then Global War Thirty Six include uh, HBG included like the the first strike. Good mechanic. I think it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, 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 and I also like how it plays with uh, terrain, where mm -hmm. um, with rivers. I don't think artillery are, are they, no, they don't not. suffer in that first no, round of combat. Don't. Yeah, so and it kind of represents like a little aspect of the tactical sense of well, you're not trying to lug artillery over rivers. Yeah, rivers that's right. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, I like the system quite a bit. It makes sense. Um, what did they do in Axis and Allies 1914 for artillery? They did something similar, right? They boosted up infantry as well. Yeah, it was yeah. just a kind of 1940 combined arms where like concept right. where you just certain units. That's and then, right. Although, so it was aircraft yeah. boosted up artillery. One aircraft yep. was not. Yeah, so that was a. I like that mechanic of having like yeah. the observer plane, the dog fights occurring, and then uh, the ground stuff. That was really cool. That was a neat system. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. HBG, if I remember correctly, they had this, they have a similar system for their 1914 map, if memory serves. When they, we did the play test, something similar with aircraft, and I think that's just works all around quite nicely. So it's a good system. I like it, <laughs> and I think that's yeah. what's going to be natural. Is like people are using the same playbook. Like historically, that's what they operated as observing planes for artillery. So it makes sense. Um, I wanted to read a little quote here. I feel like I've read this once to you before as well, and I wanted to hear your thoughts on the subject. Let me find it here. Maybe I'll actually share it on the screen so that it benefits other people and so they're not just listening to my voice itself. Bum -ba -da -ba -dum. All right. So here's the quote. It's by Major General J.B.A. Bailey. So from the middle of the 18th century to the middle of the 19th century, artillery is judged to have accounted for perhaps 50% of battlefield casualties. In the 60 years preceding 1914, this figure was probably as low as 10%. So that means, you know, you know, I'm just saying this for my benefit, not that you need the explanation. It means that the artillery didn't do as many casualties, you know, prior to 60 years prior to 1914. So from 1950 onwards, including the American Civil War, the casualties from artillery was as low as 10% in the battlefield. That's massive. 
The remaining 90% fell to small arms, whose range and accuracy had come to rival those of artillery. They just fired so quick at that point, art uh, infantry weapons, that you know artillery was not doing as many casualties. The British Royal Artillery, at over 1 million men, grew to be larger than the Royal Navy. Uh, the percentage of casualties caused by artillery in various theaters since 1914 in the First World War, 45% of Russian casualties and 58% of British casualties on the Western Front. So huge, right? It jumped right up. In the Second World War, 75% of British casualties in North Africa and 51% of Soviet casualties, 61%. And 70% of German casualties on the Eastern Front and in the Korean War, 60%. That's huge. That's massive, right? So it tells you that artillery used to be quite important from the middle of the 18th century, so 1750 to, you know, 1850, uh, is it 1850? So 50% of battlefield casualties, after that it drops right down, and then it picks itself up again. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, it kind of also goes with how, I guess it fits into with like the development of artillery, because in, you know, 18th century prior, without stuff like exploding shot, you're just, mm. an artillery piece, other than being like a, anti-material device for like warships yeah. and fortifications it's really just a big gun shooting a big projectile yeah that that's right may or may not hit something yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you know in napoleonic times they had canister shot shrapnel and all this other stuff that uh you know exploding shot like you said you know it just made huge damage in the ca uh, in the battlefield and then in 19 uh, 1850 when infantry weapons started to fire quicker you could start firing from laying down position or behind walls and all this other stuff, right? Suddenly it just changed completely and now infantry are doing, you know, longer ranges, doing more casualties as well. So it's wild to think that way. And now how does this relate to Global War 36? Well, um, it's it's on multiple different aspects, I guess, because our artillery sufficiently representative in, in not Global War 36 specifically, let's say, but in this genre, Axis and Allies games, do we see them doing 50% of the casualties and... And what could we do to make it more historically connect with, with the historical facts? What do you think? Well, one thing that I've always like tried to, I don't know, think about was like how in, uh, in Axis and Allies style combat and like mm -hmm. what we see in Global War, it's we basically, you know, you move everything into a territory and yeah. it you know, represents a long drawn out conflict. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, fair um, yeah, where like battle lines are being established, whereas like and while you do get that and and i guess it's kind of like endemic with the game and you can't really have like something shoot from another territory mm -hmm. that often because it's representing such a big amount of, true. of space yeah. yeah there is like a fact that artillery like you don't wheel it around and like you know use it like a, a someone would walk around with like a rifle it's like mm -hmm. a supporting device mm -hmm. yeah like yeah you'll use it to like help out the infantry like you'll you'll take a fort using artillery to support it but the artillery is going to stay behind while the infantry then takes the fort then mm -hmm. you may move the artillery up so mm -hmm. one thing i like have kind of thought about is like a way to get make artillery a little bit more of like i guess deadly but also being more of like a supporting weapon like yeah i guess with like uh with combined arms and it boosting infantry it's almost like if infantry were overall weaker units in general right. than they are right now and then artill then you would like need artillery to bring them up to at least like a fighting like yeah, like yeah, a, yeah. i guess a, a decent fighting level yeah. yeah when i count artillery and their strength i actually count them you know they in in global i'm we're using global 36 as, as an example because the numbers are more fresh in our heads and such like that and it's common ground is a little bit harder to find but you know they have a value of attack three defend three but for me whenever i count them i actually count them as attack four defend three because they give that boost to infantry. So it's like one extra pip of the dice actually goes to them. So I know they don't actually roll that number, but the fact that they boost up infantry is like, well, okay, that's actually not too bad for an attack value, considering that infantry would do it too. So yeah, I think they do quite well. And 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 like you said, you know, in, in these games, in Global War 36, the combat mechanics are such that it's a long drawn out combat across multiple months. It's hard to reflect, you know, the, the true weight of how artillery had function. Like, for instance, in these games here, American Civil War, as Napoleon War, you use, you roll two dice six for every unit on the map. 
and your artillery gets long range so you get to fire from the back row and different stuff like that and so that's really cool but the battles take forever as opposed to global war 36 you just roll a mitt full of dice and uh, you're done whereas this you know takes forever because now it's like okay do i want to move these guys to the front row or keep them in the back row and so it's like the design mechanic for global war 36 the combat is simplified to some extent um and to make it kind of work out, I guess, but we lose some of that magic of the artillery or the king of the battlefield has kind of disappeared to some extent <laughs> in the 36. Yeah. 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 I would say I agree with what you said about supportive weapons that, that they, they would probably be, they should be kind of embody a lot of the support behind the battlefield. And so what they do in, um, in Axis and Allies, you know, the fire support of giving units of that extra dice roll. Now for me, what I would do or what I would, think about doing because the problem with sorry i'm rambling on here now but one of the problems with artillery is the fact that they are just one piece of one piece of plastic and you'll have people saying okay well they're not going to be you know artillery wasn't just in one grand battery it was spread out across a you know multiple amount of brigades and corps and such like that it was a little bit more diversified a little bit more um and and so people argue that well, I don't know what they'll argue anyways, <laughs> but but what I'm thinking about doing is what about if you had multiple dice for every artillery piece that you have, right? That you roll, say, three dice for every artillery. And um, it, by doing that, you could actually do a lot more hits with your inf uh, artillery piece in some sense. But of course, you have to calculate the cost into that as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like that. That's a, a decent idea. Like, it's a nice fix that kind of bumps up, you, you know, the... Uh, the attack capability mm -hmm. of the artillery piece it would, because it yeah especially with world war one like era I've, I've been like doing a lot of research for my mm -hmm. game and yeah. like one thing that i was uh like pretty surprised about was like with uh on the italian front with yeah. austria hungary yeah. uh the italians outnumbered the austrians like it was right. like something crazy like 10 right. or 15 to 1. okay yeah uh, <laughs> and they even though they were attacking mountains which is already kind of a, a difficult task but yeah. the fact that the austrians were so outnumbered but the italians had like virtually no artillery okay. but the austrians did and that was like their main force but right. like with their small garrison units that had like these really well-trained artillery yeah, yeah they were able to just knock out droves of the italian army wow. okay. so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah well i think that would be interesting too because if you rolled three dice for every every artillery, let's say, or two dice or whatever, but you still could only absorb one hit on the artillery piece. So it's like, okay, well, do I want to spend, let's say if artillery costs, I don't know, five or four IPPs, it's like, okay, now my attack capability is stronger, but do I want to get one artillery or do I want to get, let's say it costs six and I roll three dice with it, but I only get one hit point to absorb on the artillery. So now I need infantry to absorb hits and artillery to give hits. And you could play around with that a little bit too, right? That you you might want a big infantry so you can absorb a lot of hits and have more staying power. But if you have more artillery, then you have more damage dealing power, right? So damage per second DPS, right? Something like that if you play video games. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And that also kind of plays into, uh, I remember, I forget what video it was, but a while ago, you I remember you talking a little bit about scratching the surface of like as the scale of games get bigger and especially with global 36 it's mm -hmm. much bigger than other games and like s units like say the fighter kind of lose some of their yeah you know, their, yeah that's their right. their abilities yeah mm -hmm. so with something like your your idea with artillery you know it makes that unit more powerful like it gives it more presence like mm -hmm. right now if i look at somebody that has a bunch of artillery i'm like well they have first strike, so that's kind of something I had to look look out mm -hmm. for. But other than that, like yeah. it's just another piece. Yeah, but yeah, with yeah. that, it's like you know just one piece yeah. of artillery, yeah. and then you're reconsidering a whole. Yeah, battle. that's right. Yeah. yeah, you are. Yeah, for sure. And it also create versatility amongst your units. Like your your infantry are the staying power. You know, he's got a lot of infantry as staying power. Your artillery are the damage dealers. Your aircraft are like, they fly in and kind of unexpected. Ah, oh, shoot, they're all coming in from like three territories away. Didn't expect that. You know, they're, they're like the surprise, you know, lightning strike, flying artillery in some sense, right? Like they're the guys that can get in there really quick. And then your tanks are like, they're blitz. They can blast through the lines, but of course they cost a lot. So you can't afford to have like a massive army of them, but they break through the front and maybe get into some of those back areas. You know, they all have their distinctive roles whereas right now artillery 
I think they're good. Don't get me wrong. I, I like artillery in, in, in Global War 36, but I think they could be a little bit more like expanded upon a bit more. Yeah. And, and I would say the same thing is applicable to ships as well. Like I love the uniqueness of the ships, but they're all fairly standard. Light cruiser, this combat value, this, you know, bomb at this stuff costs this much. Destroyer, this and this and this. Hybrid cruiser, this, this, this. It's like very standard. It's like you just get a larger version of the same thing and, and nothing too special. So it'd be nice if we had some more diversity amongst the abilities of all the pieces. Like if the pieces are out there, let's make them more interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember um, it was... Uh... Before V3 came out, Admiral Seabass was doing a solo game of Global 36. Yeah. And I think to kind of like, I guess, experiment with new ideas, he had battle cruisers and light cruisers. Mm -hmm. But then as like a little like side note was like battle cruisers got, a fr they had, um I think, a target select of like one kind of like see. a tactical sure. bomber. Yeah, and yeah, then yeah. light cruisers were anti-aircraft right yeah built in, so that i think that makes gives sense, them yeah. some more importance yeah absolutely absolutely yeah yeah i think that's worthwhile doing and that's not um i mean yeah like light cruisers there are platforms that could be used for anything but a common one was in a kind of anti-aircraft role um and i think that works out nicely i like what you said too as the map gets bigger we have to look at questioning things that we took as 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 doctrine before like access and allies it makes sense but now in global war 36 it's time to start looking at things in more in depth, like aircraft, as you mentioned, artillery could be another one, and, and ships, in some sense, are another one as well. Like when the early days of uh, Axis and Allies Classic, you had your subs representing your sub packs or whatever you want to call it, your transport fleets, your battle cruiser, uh, battleship fleets, your capital ship fleets, and was there something else? I, was it I think. Yeah, aircraft carriers, but I mean, original game that was a no cruisers, no destroyers. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, they just represented battle fleets in some sense. And now we've moved on quite a bit or further away from that, that it'd be nice to see more complexity. Anyways, going back to, to artillery. So another one worthwhile talking about, I think, would be um, <clears throat> anti-aircraft, because I'd consider that as part of artillery. Now, one thing I... I think a good strategy for me when I design expansions, or not that I'm doing too much of anything, but when I'm designing my board games, my philosophy is... There's two factors behind it. Anyways, the second factor is um, everything you add adds complexity, but it also has the potential of adding flavor and entertainment, right? So it's like minimal complexity with most entertainment and flavor. And now the way I describe flavor is like special units that, that do something a little bit interesting, some sort of romantic kind of gesture in some sense. It's like, well... Um, you know, uh, the a specialist German or commando unit or, or like the, the black shirts that the Italians have or something along those lines, something that gives some immersive quality. And then entertainment is just generally kind of enjoyment of the game. And complexity is like, well, now I have to dig through like three pages of rule books just to get the fine features of, okay, I can't build it in, you know, uh, this, you know, stuff, right? It's like, yes, it'd be cool if, if, if all of Canada, let's say, if Quebec and Ottawa and Ontario both had a minor factory, but maybe I should just combine them into a medium factory in Ottawa and just say good enough, right? Uh, that kind of level of, you know, complexity to, to entertainment value. Um, when it comes to artillery, I sometimes wonder if adding that extra unit for artillery is worth it, especially since anti-aircraft didn't function as like bodies of anti-artillery batteries. By nature, they were split up and, and spread around quite a bit. And... And often, you know, like in the German army, the uh, the, the anti-aircraft was actually part of the air force, not part of the ground forces. And so I think it'd be interesting if instead of having, instead of having an anti-aircraft unit, you take that away just to simplify the game. And that's just my personal preference to simplify the game, open up the board a little bit and actually give your artillery a dual purpose role. Say you can use them in this form or in this form and that's what larry harris did with the war room where you have postures for your unit is like your infantry could go on defensive posture and in that case he has one extra hit point essentially or an offensive posture when he could roll an extra combat dice and so likewise the artillery had do you want it an anti-aircraft roll or artillery roll and you choose which one they would function and that's actually a really cool mechanic as well yeah yeah i uh in my world war one game i was you know, like looking for, for inspiration. And I saw a line in the trenches, um, tech chart. And in oh, yeah, that okay. he had, um, 
he had uh, artillery guns being able to be used as like special anti-aircraft guns and kind of using that as, as an idea because so in my game aircraft especially like stuff like zeppelins like they start mm -hmm. out pretty menacing because there's right. no way to shoot them down sure. yeah, fighters absolutely. included yeah. Yeah, yeah uh but then later on with with technology you can research better like anti-aircraft defense mm -hmm. and with mm -hmm. that your artillery pieces now have that that ability to shoot down aircraft Perfect. so like yeah. And and yeah, I like that fact because it's like it once you get that, it's like now artillery are like such a big asset because yeah. you can start clearing out yeah, the skies. Totally, totally. Yeah, totally. I mean they were the kings of the battlefield for a reason, I think, right? They should be like almost dominating on the battlefield, but you need infantry to back them up. And so it's not quite rock, paper, scissors, you know, not I don't think I don't think we should simplify the game to rock, paper, scissors where it's like this gets that and this gets that. But it's like a combined approach to all your armies where you're like, I need a little bit of everything. And I think if we start seeing any battle force, land, sea, or air, getting into mono monotype units, then it's like we're, there needs to be some redesign here. You know, if if somebody starts pumping out nothing but subs, nothing but destroyers or, or light cruisers or whatever, it's like well, there's a mistake there that needs to be corrected for. <laughs> yeah, but what you say there about technology development too is is actually really good too because you could always use certain features as well. Where they get certain abilities, I mean, it's already been done. Where you get certain abilities later on through through it as well. So, for instance, you could say, I don't know, I'm not huge on on World War II technological development, but theoretically, you could say by stage one on the Global War 36 chart, then if you're working on advanced artillery, then at stage one, if you're sitting at stage one, then you could actually develop, or maybe it's stage two. I don't know. Yeah, anyways, you get the idea. Then you, your, then your tanks now, or sorry, your artillery now has the capability of hitting tanks. Something like that. And now they function as anti-aircraft, anti-tank, and artillery. And so if you ever roll like a one on your dice, it's like now they're functioning in their anti-tank role, and every other hit that they have is against um, land forces. Something like that, right? You get to kind of break it up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... Uh... Yeah, because cause then um, I guess another thing too with, with artillery and their role, how they're uh, represented, um, like another thing that I've always kind of wondered about is like, I think, I can't remember if it was your video or somebody else's, the strategy of building a bunch of artillery as like Germany and then yeah <laughs> might have been general yeah i don't i, I made don't a remember. i made a video about that it's on private now so you can't access it but yeah uh, you you build a lot of artillery and then all your free hits eventually you you compound on that one and eventually get a lot of because you're getting yeah. free hits where the, your enemy can't respond and by the end of it it's like you're just rolling thunder as you work your way across europe yeah so. yeah and and like looking at it in that sense it's like i that that's when it comes to like the role of artillery like in reality getting like mixed with like because i i know that in the game artillery would likely represent like some mechanization yeah and, like, yeah you know, being able right, to move yeah. around but but it's like when i think about stuff like that in reality it's like if germany made like ten thousand artillery pieces <laughs> yeah. in 1936 and was yeah. just had just a bunch of guys wheeling them up yeah, shooting yeah. Up the place, <laughs> wheeling them. yeah so it's like i i i've been trying to like think about stuff like that when it comes to i remember like uh Access Miles 1914 had where you couldn't leave like equipment, yeah, like, tanks, right. planes, artillery unattended. I that's wasn't right. a huge fan of like how that worked in the game, but yeah. it was like it, it made it so you couldn't just have like a super artillery tank army yeah, yeah, driving yeah, yeah. around. For sure, for sure. And and it made you have to make choices too. Is like okay, so I have two infant, three infantry left. And some some artillery is like now I have to start thinking should I take with the artillery or the infantry because you might have a purpose for that infantry to kind of you know maybe move it forward and split into two territories or something like that. So I like I liked it, but I'll, also it was one extra little rule that you had to think about. And yeah, you know I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, what would you say in regards to 1914? One of the struggles I'm coming across in in the design of my game is ammo consumption for artillery now that was something that was prominent the munition consumption in world war one was huge is that at a certain point they're like yeah artillery can't even fire now because we yeah. need to reserve what we have for defense and we're just stripping everything away in like minutes essentially so what would you say how are you tackling unless it's too much to, unless unless you feel like it's giving away too much but how would you tackle that in in your game with munition consumption 
Yeah, I was I was thinking about that for a while when it came to like you know some you know kind of rudimentary like supply and stuff yeah, because yeah. it's like should this army be able to defend at full value if it's completely surrounded? Right, by? right, right, right. Um, I I ended up and especially yeah reading about it kind of like how you were saying like there was points when like you know they had literally no shells like for yeah, the entire army. That's so, right. Yeah, um, yeah, it definitely matters. But mm. um, I think I kind of came along like it's just another like level of of um stuff you have to worry about yeah, but yeah. one thing i am at least right now thinking about keeping it as is that in my event cards which i i, I i've been kind of reworking for this game yeah i think that there's going to be some because a lot of it is random events that kind of are inspired by historical right. things happening right but oh, I there's see. also yeah. yeah there'll be some like event cards which will be things that maybe players can actually like play sure and so yeah. it'll say like um like british artillery shortage like that's Britain, right. yeah. that works good. Yeah, yeah. Can't, yeah yeah stuff like that so mm -hmm. that's yeah. a good way of doing it i like that system because that kind of puts in that historical factor that was you know somewhat important in world war one and it also plays along with the game because you could be like okay now either all artillery can't fight for the next turn or you can only fight defensively or something like that, right? You know, so that works out quite nicely, very tidily without overcomplicating things too much. My my solution was much more complex and <laughs> I'm not sure if I should go with it, but, but my solution was something like keep artillery reasonably cheap, have them roll three dice in combat, they hit at a decent amount, right? Like, so in, in equivalence of, of uh, you know, have them hit, you know, almost like 40% of the time, if not more. But every time every time one artillery fires, you have to, you lose one buck or production point each time they fire. And so you're like, okay, round one, I have to spend, you know, I'm gonna fire with three artillery and the, you know, they're gonna do a decent amount of damage because they have pretty decent chances of hitting, let's say 50% or whatever it is. But it's like, okay, but do I want to expend you know, I might want to buy that extra infantry and, and I don't want to, you know, overproduce here too much or fire too much. So I'll just use it for two rounds and then hold off because I might need something in reserve just in case, you know, I'm attacked next turn. I want to throw a few extra bucks in there. So that was my solution. And I still might stick with it just because I want to try it out and see how it goes. But I thought that was kind of an interesting way of tackling that problem. <laughs> yeah, that, that definitely is pretty cool. Like I've never heard of that one, like kind of having to spend like pay to use right? actually or like yeah whatever yeah pay to use basically. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah but it's it, an interesting way to do it makes it. sense because you had a lot of munitions factory in world war one um they did a lot of damage and it tied up a good chunk of the workforce so it's like yeah you know maybe maybe it could kind of work but the problem there is it adds complexity because now it's like you have to make that decision each round do i want to spend money okay and then you have to you know spend that money and you know it adds flavor, yeah, but is it worthwhile for the complexity that you add to the game? It's a lot more thinking that you have to do. Um, but maybe, maybe, right? Like it might be a, a thing worth doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. So oh, here, hold on a hold on a second. Okay. Sorry about this. Yeah. No. Worries. Gonna take, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right on. So we've talked about artillery. Now there's there's We've talked about it in the context of this game. Now, in, in other games, what they've done is essentially just increase like the strength factor of what you're doing. So another famous one, Paths of Glory. All they do in this game is you're attacking with a certain amount of strength. You know, you have two infantry and one artillery. Is that this game? That might not be this game. It might be something else. It might be something else I'm thinking of. But you add their combat factors together, and it's like, this is how much they attack with. And that's one way of doing things for sure. Global War 36, they have it as a special unit. And there's different ways to tackle artillery as well. And, you know, everything we say here is just our opinion, of course. <laughs> but I guess we've talked about um, regular artillery. I think advanced artillery is pretty self-evident. It's roughly the same thing. Um, there's also, I don't know if it's worthwhile talk, we've talked about anti-aircraft, we've talked a little bit about anti-tanks, unless you have something more to add about anti-tank artillery, if there's anything worth mentioning there. Yeah, not not really anything that too much comes to mind. I, I, I did like your little suggestion, I have thought about that before with like having a, a specific value, like roll a one, that represents mm. the anti-tank mm. com mm. companies, like actually doing something against mm. tanks, mm. and you can hit an enemy armor yeah mm -hmm. um yeah yeah but, yeah I've, I've done that even with a tech once you get to a certain tech in world war or in the interwar period 
then you uh, you could unlock a tech for the, your infantry to start doing that as well to to represent you know Panzerfausts and all this other stuff in World War II, where now your infantry is equipped with some level of anti armor weaponry as well. So if they roll a one, now they're rolling um, you know their anti tank hits, and so when you look at I mean, it'll be custom dice as well, too. You'll roll out your custom dice and be like, okay, I, I, I see here that these are, you know, this result here. And so that means I have this many anti-tank hits that you have to take on something with a hard shell on it. And, and yeah, that's the way that's resolved. <laughs> and um, yeah. then there's coastal artillery. Let's talk about coastal artillery a little bit. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that could be improved? Because in my opinion, fortifications need, in Global War 36, need fixing not in 36, just by 1914, and probably they've fixed them in 1914, but I think fortifications need some massive reevaluation of how they function. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, um, and yeah, I, I thought that, and I, so in my first 1914, like, modified Axis and Allies game, I had coastal guns, and they were a lot like um, uh, Global 36, where basically amphibious landing, bombardment ships, and mm -hmm. transports right. got, I think in my game, it was two shots. Okay. And, you know, if they get hit, they're sunk. Yeah. Um, and and so in my game, like what I found was, well, it, also in, in Global 36, because they were, mine were pretty much the same. And so like, right. uh, and what I found was just like, they for one, they don't have enough oomph sometimes. Like I think if like they were maybe more expensive and pose more of a threat. Like I remember in J as Japan one time in a game, I thought, you know what? Like to protect all my islands, I'll mm. buy coastal guns for all of them. It's like right. a decent, yeah. it's expensive, but a okay investment. Yeah. But then you just have the U S roll up the three shots miss sure. like, every yeah, time. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, yeah. yeah, no yeah. So, uh, yeah. so there's definitely that, but, um, and, and then in my game, my new one now like artillery have again another dual purpose where they act as a coastal gun if there's a amphibious amphibious assaults in in this in in i guess i'll call it the powder keg because that's the same but in the powder keg like yeah. they have uh less chance of happening they're not like as they're really dramatic and right. not as important so it's like right uh but just in case you know you might not want to attack a heavily artillery fortified right, zone. Right, right. They can shoot hmm. up the ships. Yeah, I mean, that's worthwhile doing in World War One. Uh, I, I remember in, in several games, like I like World War One games quite a bit. So I've played both online ones as, as are like computer ones as well as board game ones. And there's always that potential that you can do your amphibious landings but it's never going to really benefit you that. I mean, like the risks aren't quite there. Uh, the risks aren't worth the re No. I don't know how to put it, but it is extremely difficult to keep them all supplied. And I think even in, in say, in Global War 3, 1914, if you have anything s similar in set up in regards to naval bases and such too. So you could always be like, I'm doing a landing in Normandy, um, but it's only got, in this case, it's got two ports in it. Normandy does. It's got like a, a, two ma a, a major naval port and then a shipyard. So each of them could supply three infantry. Right, so you could say I could only drop off six units there, and something like that. You could play a certain system like that, and it's like, okay, well, so I could supply six units there, but I also have three transports off the coast, so each transport could supply two infantry. So now you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So you have twelve infantry that could sit in Normandy that could function at their full defensive combat values, but anything in excess of that, you know, and that tends to suffer. And then if if uh, they push into another territory and don't pick up any more ports well they could still only supply 12 units and that way you could kind of keep your supply chain and see where it bottlenecks on the ports and, and so likewise in 1914 you could do something similar you could do a small landing uh, you know like little raids but it's like yeah to keep you guys supplied that's going to be really difficult to do that because that's the problems they had in, in um well in gallipoli for one anyways and in sinai yeah. for another so <laughs> yeah and that's in my game uh because supply isn't a thing but um just the ability to like reinforce mm. and also like evacuate forces is like mm. important so yeah. like with ports you're able to like because uh, another reason like why amphibious assaults wouldn't be as important is because of the the lack of like transports and the ability right. to like get a huge amount of army right. deployed right. so right. an important factor is um in my game like ports are able to like 
move infantry. Right, so, yeah, I like that. Brilliant. Yeah, and, and so, like, it, it means that if, say, let's say the British launch an invasion into Mesopotamia, but mm-hmm. then they lose Kuwait, well, now yeah. they, you know, normally the British player would be like, it's just it's a tiny territory, who sure. cares? Yeah. But in my yeah. game, it's like, well, the British player doesn't have a ton of transports, mm-hmm. so they're going to mm-hmm. need that port to keep reinforcing. Yeah, that's what I wrote back in the day when I was working on my own expansion, and it was something pretty well the exact same thing is you could like naval move using the same concept as well as basically every port can pick up and receive a certain amount of units and you could just basically almost teleport whatever you want to call it you could trace their path and it goes and it has to be a certain kind of routine it's like each port can't pick up and drop off it can't so you i know we're going off topic from artillery here but you picked up something in england and next hop off point within three sea zones it could drop off in gibraltar but now the gibraltar part ports used and so you can't use it again to move another unit and so that one would go from Gibraltar to Cairo to wherever all else and as long as you're not doubling up with the same port by hopping through it you know with another unit then you're legit and so if you could find another route to go around Africa and one using this port and one to go this port then you're all set so that would be one way of doing that yeah of course it's a little bit more yeah. figuring out but yeah that, but anyways let's go back to artillery yeah. and coastal artillery so I think in Global War 36, the way coastal artillery work is is okay enough, but it doesn't really, it's not really in, hugely inspiring. Like, it's good, don't get me wrong. It's a good feature and such, but it's one of those things I wonder if there could be a little bit more. But I don't know if I could think of anything a bit more, so maybe it's just good enough, right? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, I honestly, like, the way that, like, it's mechanics, yeah. I think that I, I like them, like, the fact that, if it hits a transport, like yeah. now you've just yeah. lost two units plus a transport. That's um, right, yeah. And then also the the ability to shoot across narrow straits. I really that's like true. that because like, you know, you pile them up on a narrow straight and now that's like mm. a very dangerous yeah. thing to cross. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I but, think they should tie in in yeah. some way with artillery. That's one of the reasons I brought them up is like, if you have artillery sitting in that territory and you have a coastal artillery present, then you almost get a boost to your artillery defense of that coastal area. I think that would be interesting as well, giving, because I know fortifications normally give that boost, but I think it'd be cool to see artillery being boosted in some sense because of coastal artillery presence. Yeah, and, and that makes sense too. Like it would maybe represent, and I mean, maybe you could even like simplify it in the sense of uh, you've got you know, fortifications, which normally go on land borders, mm. but then you place a fortification on the coast and now it acts as, you know, it's like fire control for artillery. Right. Yeah. It also yeah. represents entrenched infantry. Yeah. Like, That's what yeah. I think too, is like, I think maybe it would be the way of simplifying it, but just say fortifications, condense coast artillery and fortifications together and saying, if a fortification is built on a coast, this is what it does. And if it's built against a land border, this is what it does. And then that simplifies things to some extent and, and you could still, yeah, it would still work out. But I do think, you know, way fortifications work in my mind anyways, like if I was designing something completely from scratch, I would say, okay, so fortification prevents you from being hit because you have a concrete block between myself and the enemy's bullets. That's what the way I design it. But then it's like Global War 36 is like, no, no, no. It gives you a better chance of hitting the enemy. But shouldn't it be the other way around where the enemy has a harder time hitting you? So that's... That's why I think, and of course, yes, you should have an easier time of hitting the enemy because you got, you know, little slits and such you could shoot through from, but still shouldn't that major factor behind it is you're protected from being hit and you have, you have it scoped out that you can hit the enemy a bit more, but now it's just, just one-sided essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, and I can, I, yeah, I, I like how the fortification, don't they take two hits right the, no they don't take any hits, hits. Or, they, oh, they they don't hit. they roll two hits oh, they for shoot two. Yeah, yeah they shoot two hits. yeah or two rolls and so. yeah and it's like i could see that being you know like maybe built in artillery mm-hmm. stuff like that but i i like your your thoughts on it's like it prevents or it helps prevent the enemy from hitting you like when you look at like say like a good example of like a well-defended area like in real life like iwo jima was mm-hmm. bombarded for like yeah like i forget it was like days or weeks Mm -hmm. and when the marines landed it was like just as hard to yeah that's right infantry were just hiding in the that's right so it's like yeah yeah. and that actually also helps with like one thing i've always kind of like that's like irked me in 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 a well just in like all the kind of access analyze games and global 36 where like 
you put three infantry on an island if the americans roll up with a bunch of battleships and yeah. and guys and whatever bombardment those infantry are gone marines land and like there's no resistance <laughs> i just wasted <laughs> i wasted the investment in, in putting right. infantry there yeah but you know if you had like maybe a, a fortification instead of shooting back it's like soaking up hits and that's what i was going to suggest defenders. that's what i was going to suggest is like fortifications they absorb three hits every round of combat or whatever right and so it's like okay so the enemy comes in there with just a small force and they don't get three hit they you know get four hits well you only take one hit damage you know one of your units off the other three are absorbed now next round they get lucky and roll six hits and now you take three right and so that way they're like buffering you in some sense and there's some squish there where you're not taking as many casualties and if you are taking casualties it could be explained away as like well the concrete blocks are stopping the hits it's slowing down the enemy attack um, the artillery isn't as effective. You have field hospitals present near behind the front lines. You have, you know, facilities built up preparing so you can ship the guys right back into it. Uh, you know, the defensive forces back to where it needs to go. It's like, I think that's the way it should be. Is There should be some squish or whatever you want to call it where you have a force attacking the Maginot and each round, apart from the defense bonus the Maginot line gives to the French, they also have some absorbing power for every round of combat, I think. Now, you could say that the, the defensive plus two that they get on the first round, I know for Maginot it's plus three, but the defensive plus two, maybe that could only last for one round. But I think every other round after that, the defense should still have an absorption fa factor of three. And that's not like a new idea either. I'm not just, you know, like um, Axis and Allies 19... 14 well it worked a little bit in 1914 since it's one round of combat anyways but the tanks did the same thing they absorbed hits right so you just do this in every round of combat now it doesn't work for yeah. you for a 1914 game if you have one round of combat but <laughs> i mean yeah. it could still work i suppose yeah yeah well i guess yeah i guess so yeah, yeah. you would just yeah you just you like could, the tanks yeah have that you could squish, do, yeah. yeah you could do it with trenches i suppose they absorb one hit for every you know or whatever the enemy throws at you they roll six hits and you absorb three on your trenches or something like that right yeah 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 anyway that covers that and yeah yeah uh, in regards to like the whole idea of bombarding from ships and such you know i would say just to tie it in with artillery and i think we should kind of wind up here is when it comes to mountain terrain i don't think the enemy should be as effective in bombarding with ships as you know i don't think it makes sense because as you know with with um the the fight between the italians and the austrians there was like a lot of little places they could hide away <laughs> from being bombarded by so yeah yeah plus you have to elevate quite a bit more too with your your uh ships i don't think they could actually hit in some of those higher up places <laughs> yeah yeah and that kind of goes with like um with like places i, I guess I remember uh, one YouTuber calling them unassailable shores. And I, I remember actually seeing... Oh, that's a cool uh, concept, yeah. Yeah, and um, actually with Global 1914, yeah. uh, with uh, them showing it off, uh, Australia, the Great Barrier Reef is... Pre I didn't see it anywhere else on their map so far, but like the Great Barrier Reef, it, they've represented it. So like, I right. guess... That's cool. It could, yeah, it could just be there, but I mean, I would assume in the game it'd be kind of cool if you can't actually land because, of course, oh, you're going to yeah. be running aground. Yeah, they could but, just be simply naming yeah. the sea zones as well, too, right? You know, they could be. I, I know that's what um, they were talking about doing back in the day. So it could be. Uh, it could be something like that that they're not actually implementing a barrier reef. But that's cool. That's really cool if they did something like that. That'd be neat. Unassailable shore. Neat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that'd be neat. And and fair enough, I think that's a decent idea too. Like the coast of Normandy or Norway, sorry, it'd be like much, much harder to attack than, you know, the coast of, you know, England, let's say. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, that's that was a good talk. So I appreciate it, Cobra, and uh we'll have to do it again sometime. Yeah. Okay, I'll talk to you later. All right, see ya. Bye.